we should be different from the rest of the world. We're going, God, I actually want your leadership in my life. I want your your commands in my life. I want to be a part of your kingdom. I want a king. It's not like, uh, you know, when in the period of the judges where everyone just want to do what was right in their own heart. Um, we're going, no, we want leadership, Lord. We love your leadership. We love your commands. That's weird to the world. Welcome to the Crazy Love Podcast. In today's episode, Francis sits down to discuss some of the challenges facing today's church leaders. How do you lead in a culture that's growing more and more opposed to authority? And he shares one of the most important lessons he's learned in all of his years of leadership. All right, thanks for joining our Crazy Love Podcast. This week I am with Sean Brakey. Sean Brakey is one of the elders at our church and... We've been friends for, uh, I don't know, what, 10, 12 years? Yeah, 2010, so like 13. Is that I when think? you started coming to see me? I came in 2009. Oh, we weren't and then friends you moved. the first couple of years. Right. Well, yeah. I was only, I was there from 2009 to 2011. You moved yeah. in 2011. Okay. January. Okay. So we met in 2010. Okay. But 2012 yeah, is when we actually, probably, you actually started to like me. In yeah. <laughs> I don't know, like you, but I <laughs> talked to you. Oh, I see. Yes, that's right. That's <laughs> Graced right. you with conversation. <laughs> I um, really appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah, and Sean is heading up our, along with a guy named Rob Zabala, another one of our elders, heads up our church intensive, which is uh, pastors, leaders coming from really all around the world. And you've been doing that how long? That's been six and a half years. Six and a half years. Mm -hmm. And how many pastors have come through? We've probably had about 2,500 okay. pastors, leaders. Yeah, just to talk to them about church and, I mean, really to minister to them, but also have discussions about church and mm -hmm. house gatherings, smaller gatherings, just um, but really just biblical commands of what the church ought to be. Mm -hmm. So... Today we're going to talk a little bit about leadership. He had some questions that I think a lot of these pastors are asking, and so um, you go ahead and lead me. Yeah, whatever. So be yeah. weird. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Finally, yeah, thirteen years in, I get yeah. to lead Francis. Um, so, yeah, I think you know, like you mentioned, the church intensive. A lot of it has been, I think, trying to stay in step with how the spirits led you in really rethinking the church, mm -hmm. right? So. Um, not deconstructing in the way that I think a lot of people are, yeah. which is like stepping away from the scriptures, but mm -hmm. really trying to press in deeper to the scriptures. Like, mm -hmm. What does God clearly say mm -hmm. in scripture that he wants of us as his church? And so one of the topics that comes up a lot is leadership. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm curious for you, as you have gone through this process of rethinking things according to scripture, what are some of the things that you feel you're, you're more convinced of now in regard to leadership? that God yeah. desires in Scripture. Yeah, I mean, it seems like that's the instruction is to appoint elders in every city. And somehow that was going to solidify the church. Mm. I mean, Paul goes and he plants these churches. Um, and it seems like, because he's only there for a few weeks sometimes, and these mm. churches start it would be hard for him to appoint elders and go, well, you seem really mature after two weeks. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like the church went on for a while, but then he's telling Timothy and Titus, look, you need to go back and there need you need to establish elders, these leaders, and gives you these qualifications in Timothy and in Titus about what their lives should look like and then you move to Hebrews, and it talks about how you're to obey these leaders. You're supposed to observe the outcome of their way of life and imitate their their faith. And so it does seem like my best understanding of Scripture is the church is not just, hey, everyone, we, we are all absolutely 100% equal male, female, slave, free, whatever, in the sight of God as far as positionally before him. But uh, there is clear evidence in the New Testament that there ought to be spiritual leadership in the church. And so I know a lot of the smaller church movements uh, tend to be about, 
hey, there's no leader amongst us. We're all just buddies hanging out. We don't feel like we need a leader. Um, but scripture seems to suggest, uh, or even command, yeah. <laughs> it's a very strong suggestion, um, that there's a role for the shepherds, for the leaders, and, uh, and that they're to take care of the flock well. I mean, even just that analogy of a shepherd to a flock. Um, I mean, it's not like all the sheep are just hanging out. It's like, who wants to lead today? You know, it's there's there's a clear leader amongst them, and I see that in scripture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like what what you said, we found to be super common is uh, a lot of people that have said, "Hey, you know, we're, we're rethinking a lot of these things in mm -hmm. the church." Hey, I don't know if we necessarily need a big building, mm -hmm. but you know, we're not against buildings, but. Hey, I don't know if we need this huge, you know, they're, they're rethinking a lot of like the programs mm -hmm. and then they go, yeah, and I don't know if we need leadership and you're hitting it right on that it, it's in so oftentimes it'll be with some very spiritual language, which uh, sounds good, which is like, hey, Jesus is the leader, right? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. he's the leader of the church. There's no human leader of his church. Mm -hmm. And um, and so that's super helpful as you're pressing in on that, because uh, that's what we try to emphasize a lot is, yeah, but biblically we see these texts about submitting to mm -hmm. leadership. And so I, I guess maybe going on that, a couple of texts that I'm curious for you to um, speak to, into is Second Corinthians 13.10. Paul writes, for this reason I write these things while I'm away from you, that when I come I may not have to be severe in my use of the authority that the Lord has given me for building up and not for tearing down. So here Paul is talking about the mm -hmm. authority that he has. Mm -hmm. Titus 2.15, he says, Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Mm -hmm. So Paul is telling Titus mm -hmm. to rebuke and exhort with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Mm -hmm. Right. So there is like a mm -hmm. he's calling towards authority. Um, I don't know, thoughts as you hear those texts, like what does that mean for us to have authority? Yeah, well, I, th I think my first thought is when people hear authority, it's like a bad word. Mm. It's negative, and I, my mind goes to Ephesians 4, where it's talking about uh, Christ, and it says, when he ascended on high, he led a ho host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. And saying he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also descended into lower regions, the earth, he who uh, descended is the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things and he gave the apostles the prophets the evangelists the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of christ so it's this idea of christ going up to heaven and yet he's dispensing these gifts to his church so he's leaving the earth he was on the earth but now he's leaving the earth but he's giving these gifts to men and then he describes these people uh, and it's same thing he gave the apostles prophets evangelists shepherds and teachers to equip the saints it's it was a gift to us um and I mean, we think about this with, with every, we think this way with everything. God's commands, like, ah, uh, commands. And that's not the way the scriptures talk about his commands. Mm -hmm. His commands lead to life. The psalm is in one nine, Psalm 119 is like, he goes, I open my mouth and I pant, longing for, you know, these commands. I've got like, I want it, I want it, I want his truth, because it's so good. And in the same way, we as believers, we, we should be different from the rest of the world. We're going, God, I actually want your leadership in my life. I want your, your commands in my life. I want to be a part of your kingdom. I want a king. It's not like, uh, you know, when in the period of the judges where everyone just wanted to do what was right in their own heart. Um, we're going, no, we want leadership, Lord. We love your leadership. We love your commands. That's weird to the world. And now we're supposed to take it a step further where we go, God, you say you've given us this gift mm -hmm. of leaders in the church. Where are they? You know, I, I want to come under them and I want to find these, these godly leaders who will help me in the ways of God. That's the way it ought to look. Mm -hmm. um, but sadly, when we read those passages, 
and people hear them, there's just this sense of, ugh, I don't like that. Right. Yeah, totally. And so I guess for leaders out there, as we think about trying to walk in that, what the Lord has for us in Mm -hmm. that regard, right? Mm -hmm. There could probably be two different sides that we could fall on. Either would be unhealthy, Mm -hmm. which is not walking in any authority, right? Mm -hmm. So being passive as a leader, being Mm -hmm. timid, like not exercising the authority that God's given us. Mm -hmm. Or on the flip side, we can maybe step outside of the spirit and start mm. maybe trying to control and manipulate and mm. push people in the flesh to do certain things. We were talking about that earlier mm. this morning. Yeah. Curious your thoughts for leaders out there. How do you walk in biblical spiritual authority? Yeah. I would say number one is look at your example. Mm. Um You know, it's the same thing we're taught as parents. You know, most of what your kids learn will be caught and not taught. Um, it's, it's, uh, It's one of those things where, yeah, we have the authority to enforce things. Um, you know, biblically we're called to that. Um, but... You know, like Paul tells Timothy, watch your life and your doctrine closely. And there's something about your life and your doctrine that will ensure the salvation of your hearers. Mm. And so you first have to look at your own life as a leader and go, why would people want to follow me? Mm. And that's, that's a, it's tough to get to the root of that. And to be honest with that and take time and to try to look at yourself as an outsider and go, wow, if I saw Francis Chan and his life, would I follow him? Would I respect him? Would I want to say, hey, teach me because I want to, I want to become like you. I want to imitate you know, like, the, like Hebrews 13 says, imitate their faith. Um, so before anything else, before we, we talk about, okay, here's what you do for this guy in your congregation who never wants to listen. You know, first, we got to take a look at ourselves and go, um, am I worthy of imitation? Mm-hmm. I, I use the illustration. I don't know if this is offensive or not, but my, my wife, you know, once went to, back then it was called aerobics, an aerobics class. And, uh, you know, we pay money, go to the gym, and this was back when I went to the gym and uh, she came home one day and I'm like hey how was it she goes there's a new teacher and she's like probably 250 pounds and so I'm like looking at her and she's doing these motions but it was I'm trying not to be judgmental and I'm not being hateful it's just as an aerobics instructor like that doesn't motivate me you know I don't go oh yeah I want to be like her you know it, it's it's just it, it's the same thing uh are we showing this life that is truly life like scripture says are we showing like first peter one says this this joy inexpressible and and full of glory it, are we showing a peace that surpasses comprehension um because a lot of times the problem is not i get it there's rebellious people they won't follow anyone but a lot of times it's like, you know, most people will look like if, you know, it's like my wife, if she saw some ripped girl that's, you know, doing all these exercises and everything else and knew that she used to be, you know, huge, then it's like, wow, I want to learn from her, you know? And in the same way, that's, that's, that's our instinct. And I think as believers, when we see a godly, godly person, gosh, I don't know about you, but my heart is just like, ah, I want to hear everything you have to say. I want to soak that in. And I genuinely believe that's the biggest problem is, you know, when leaders start saying, follow me, um, almost in a fair sake way, you know, like Jesus says, hey, listen to what they have to say, but don't do what they do. Um, that's very hard to do, and I think that's 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 why a lot of f- 
believers, parishioners, find themselves in this place where if they're really honest, they're going, no, I don't, I don't respect him. And uh, which at that point, you go, well, then I don't know if you should really be in that church. Now, there are other times when there are people who just, uh, they can't see beyond themselves. They really believe that everything they think is right. And so they follow as long as you agree with them or you're saying the things they already believe. And that's real. That's a very real situation. And, and now we have a huge movement of people that anytime they're confronted on their sin, they call it, oh, you're abusing me spiritually. Mm. When the Bible's commanding me mm. to rebuke, and call out your sin. I mean, you should want me to, you know? It's it's like, a, you know, that coach or whoever that's saying, hey, come on, I know you can do better than this. Pick it up. You know, when you're yelling back and like, you know, you're abusing me. It's like, mm -hmm. it's this weird finding because I know that there are abusive people out there, controlling people out there that are... Uh, maybe using the ministry to take advantage of people, whether it's financially, emotionally, whatever. Paul even warns against that. There'll, there'll be those that are, are making these long, you know, prayers for the sake of getting close to these widows or whatever. Just creepy stuff is out there. But uh, we're starting to call everything creepy, you know, <laughs> or... And that's not the word, but you know, spiritual abuse. And I agree, there is some out there, but be careful. Um, you can't just label any time you're confronted with your sin, spiritual abuse. Um, otherwise, what is the role of the leader anymore? Yeah, yeah, I always use the sports analogy. I think about like, for me, one of the best things for me, I think, was playing basketball growing up, mm -hmm. having coaches that would get in my face and yell mm -hmm. at me, and mm -hmm. it just, and I hated it, and yeah. I didn't like them in the moment, but yeah. in hindsight, I look back and I go, that was so good for me to, to not quit, and that's, and I don't know if those coaches even really loved me, right? <laughs> but they wanted me to be a better basketball yes. player. Yeah. So like, how, it's almost like how much more so in the church when this person loves me and they're challenging me, should I trust it? When I can look back at coaches yeah. in high school who are, uh, you know, getting on me because I keep making the same mistake and I was frustrated, yeah. but I knew it made me grow. And and it's definitely, mm -hmm. we're in a time where it's a lot harder for people to take challenge, right? People yeah. want to quit the team right mm -hmm. away. I wanted to quit, but then I wouldn't. And yeah. it was so good for me. Yeah, yeah. And I will say, I'm going to say this publicly on the air, you're a good basketball player. Oh, wow. And I will say publicly, you're a better basketball player than I am. Wow, that's yes, really big yes. for you. But when the pressure, <laughs> but, when, when the but, pressure yeah, at that, that moment, this. if it's like for the game winner, <laughs> wow. I would trust myself over you. Interesting. It's just a mental strength <laughs> I have on that. I just well, want to make that clear. But I admit it, you're better. You're wow. better in, in like every aspect. Better when it I doesn't mean. matter. Yes, yeah, there, there you go. There yes, you go. That's, that's <laughs> trying to really figure out what you're saying here. <laughs> uh, there you go. That's that's what uh, I was trying to say. Uh, wow. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for that. All right. Uh, really I got off topic. It. Sorry. Oh, it's okay. Um, so as you talk about the importance of godly leadership, um, for you, you know, you've been in the role of a senior pastor before, you know, you started We Are Church and you, mm -hmm. you from the beginning and you're trying to appoint elders. So think about mm -hmm. in the context of that, how do you try to instill a culture like that? Mm -hmm. So think about for like senior pastors out there, for people who are in leadership, they're trying to raise up new leaders. How does that get cultivated? So you're speaking to like yeah. in yourself first, yeah. right? But then how do you try to yeah. see that culture in the church? Yeah. I'm going to sound like a broken record <laughs> again, but I see it everywhere. Mm -hmm. Like when I go visit churches, their staff is so much like the, the lead pastor. Mm -hmm. There's like a, there's so many, not exactly the same, but there's so, me, so much of 
what that leader is like is you can see it in the staff um, and the people that are closest to him. And, and I mean, there's something about that that's really good because it shows that they spent a lot of time together and they start taking on the characteristics of the leader. And so, and, and, and now the phase of life that I'm at, uh, I, I bring this up again because I have regrets. I think, gosh, I just, I know Christ differently now and I may have led from a very, not, not, maybe more of a controlling, like demanding, or uh, I was just worried about producing or results mm. rather than really making sure people were doing things uh, compelled by the love of Christ. You know, sometimes as a leader, you just think, okay, I need this done, this done, this done. We need to get this sin out of the church. We've got to get, you know, our stats right now, our 80% are in pornography. Let's get that down to 30. You know, whatever, whatever it is, you're, you're pushing for something, but it's just behavior mm -hmm. that may not be motivated, you know, like the love of Christ compelling them. You could be causing people to do things out of pride, you know, to, uh, you know, like an incentive. Okay, we'll make you a pastor if, da, 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 or we'll give you a raise if, you know, this, I don't think I ever did that. But there's almost these weird incentives that are actually sinful um, because then now people are doing things out of pride and it draws attention to their own name. Um, rather than really uh, to the praise of his glorious grace. And so you end up looking back in life and, and you just wish you had been a better pastor to some of your staff. And some of it, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And some of it is just maturity. And, um, but... That's why I, I just, for those listening, I, I just want to say, man, if you're a leader right now, it's an awesome thing that you do, but it's a very heavy weight of responsibility. And most of us know, like with our children, um, you know, if we're growing in the Lord, we see how we, we maybe treated our first kid different from our seventh one. <laughs> <laughs> for those of you who are blessed um, mm -hmm. you, you know you, because you learn things over time and you see what matters and what doesn't matter so much and and so I think with shepherding it's the same thing early on you may think this matters this matters this matters and later on in time you realize oh here are the things that really do and things I'm grateful for are those friendships those relationships um Gosh, I was very close to a lot of the, the fellow leaders on the staff, and those are some of the relationships I continue on to this day and, and still laugh with them and um, enjoy the good old days. And, um, and I'm able to still encourage them in their faith, and they still encourage me in mine, and that's a gift. Um, and we'll be doing that for all of eternity. It's, it's pretty awesome. Um, and, and there's something great about being able to encourage one another after decades and go, you know what, you're still an example to me in this area or that area. And sometimes the urgency of the moment, like, well, we've got to make salary this week and we've got, you know, Easter's coming or whatever it may be. And you lose sight of uh, a lot of the fruit that is being produced um, that's going to last. And uh, I'm just kind of rambling with different thoughts. I forgot your question. But, 
Hopefully that answered something. <laughs> Doesn't matter now. Okay. Yes, that's good. Yeah, so you had referenced earlier, and I maybe want to circle back to some of, um, and we were, you know, we were talking earlier this morning just about a lot that's going on in the culture in regard to the church, right? A lot of, I don't know if it's, and it seems like it is failure in leadership increasing, mm. but even if it's not, it's definitely highlighted more, more visible. Yeah. Um, people close to you that you've w- walked, you know, kind of with through mm. failure, and mm. I guess thoughts on how yeah. maybe first as from the leader's perspective, um, how do we respond to that? How do we how do we lead maybe in light of what we can mm. see going on in church culture? Mm. Yeah, I, I guess <laughs> broken record again. Yeah. I look at myself and, you know, I've set some things up in my life, some guardrails of, you know, ever since I got married, it's like, okay, I will not go in a car with another woman. I'm not going to be alone with another woman. I'm just, you know, when I travel, you know, if it's with people I'm unfamiliar with, you know, I'll bring a, you know, one of my kids or uh, one of the staff or my wife. Um, There's just guardrails um, because I don't want to fall. Uh, so there's the discipline side of it. Um, then on the f- other side of that spectrum is my love relationship with Jesus himself. And gosh, I mean, the last couple months, I feel like all I can talk about is the love of Christ and and how excited I am about just this next season, the next few months, continuing to grow in that love. Like, I just know that my life is going to get better, period. Mm-hmm. And because it's not, it's not like, oh, because I'm not going to have any physical ailments or whatever. Gosh, I'm going to have a lot of them coming up. I'm getting older and older. And getting close. I getting know. Better. It's just like, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so but that I can't control but so well then how do you know you're gonna be happier how do you well because you can control this in a sense you know when we seek him with all our heart we will find him and at his right hand really are pleasures forevermore and so i'm going to seek that and seek that and right paul says i've learned the secret to be content in any and every circumstance yeah and so that i would say again is number one look at yourself Man, are there any seeds of that? And 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 truthfully, some of you that are listening right now are in major sin that you don't want anyone to know about. And what I will say about this is, gosh, I've heard people say, oh, you know, I just, I know I've committed adultery a hundred times. I mean, this is not, I heard this recently, <laughs> you know, but I'm going to keep leading worship Um, even though I've done this a hundred times in the last few months um, because I'm anointed Hmm. and it's for the sake of the church okay look you are first you're a hypocrite secondly you're not helping the Hmm. church Um, it's it's like Achan's sin in the Old Hmm. Testament you can hide it but then all of Israel gets punished, hmm. and they're wondering why. Um, and it all boils down to this guy where you almost look at him like, that's not fair. Well, that's part of being in the body. Hmm. Um, there's a blessing upon the church when we're walking together in unity and purity. Um, and so God blesses that. And so we, we've got to understand that the best thing you can do for your church is to step down, um, to be honest. And don't think, well, I'm going to protect the church by hiding my sin. No, that's going to kill us. Mm. You know, it's almost like Jonah being on that ship. Mm. And it's like, what? These storms are going to die. Just toss Jonah overboard. Some of you guys need to do the Jonah thing. Go, you know what? It's me. I'm I'm gonna go for a swim, you know. And I know that's that's a tough thing to hear. Um, but you gotta love the church and believe the word of God. 
Look, the whole idea of being above reproach in Scripture as an elder, the best I understand it is if everyone knows who you really are, would they still follow you? People knew what your thought life was like. They knew what your eyes looked at. They knew what your prayer life was like, what your marriage was like. Would they really still let you be in the position you're in? That's really important. Um, and I have to look at my life regularly and go, okay. No, I'm not without sin, but you know, no one's without sin, but you gotta look at your life and go, is it exemplary? Um, because there are a lot of these scandals out there and we just don't need another one. Um, it doesn't mean hide so they don't find out about it. I'm just saying, you know, bow out gracefully. Just leave for a while. Um, get your life together. Uh, the other thing I would say too is, uh, yeah, it's really hard seeing some of these guys fall that I've stood up for. Hmm. And I, I don't know what to do about that. I mean, and I'm not saying I don't love them anymore either, because I understand how tempting the enemy can be. And and sure, there's a time where they need to be out of ministry and restore their lives, but I, I think I still love them equally. Um, if anything, I have more compassion for them and want to see them restored. Um, and I think that's the right way to look at it. But there is a sadness because I just think, gosh, this... The church just doesn't look real attractive hmm. to the world. This is all they're seeing, and they're not seeing enough of the other side of what Christ offers and that real life and peace and joy um, and holiness. I mean, this is gift to us, is the ability to put to death the deeds of the flesh um, because we're in such a great love relationship. Hmm. Yeah, and as you're sharing to it, it's so good. Like, I think about, so on the other side of the spectrum, picturing the people who maybe were in a church where they experienced some um, unhealthy things from leadership, or maybe even to the point where, like, extreme hypocrisy mm. you know something comes out and it's mm. devastating for them so maybe people who are still mm. I, I, there's i know there's a lot of people out there i would imagine people who listen to this who have left the church and in their minds they're like I, I don't leave jesus but i've just i've had it with the church or unbelievers out there who might be watching this who are mm. like ah the church just looks ugly like you said or at least that's their perspective yeah what would you say to them well I would say, first of all, we're commanded, you know, I mean, Hebrews 10, you know, not to neglect this this gathering of the saints. So I don't really have that choice. If I'm a follower of God, I can't neglect these things. And then you also look at the the gifts in the, in the mention of 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 and how the eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. Um, it's... You're a part of the body and you're supposed to be, you're like, you're one finger, you know, and you're, you're, uh, you're trying to go off by yourself. Like that's not. Um, there's a way in which we're supposed to work together. And even, you know, I just saw that this, this week, someone pointed out, that in uh, first, uh, I'm sorry, Ephesians three, um, when Paul is praying for the church, uh, he says, "I th that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ." 
there's something about being together with the saints that enables us to comprehend the love of Christ. Um, very similar to, I think it's First John 4, 12-ish, where it's like no one's ever seen God, but when we love one another, somehow his love is, he's, he's made manifest amongst us. Like somehow he's there um, in the church. Uh, there's something about gathering for communion. You know, First Corinthians 10, there's something about not being divided and you come together and there's this koinonia that you have with the body and blood of Christ as you have it with the rest of the body. Mm -hmm. And once you separate from that, he says, then it's not even the Lord's Supper anymore once there's these divisions. So I, I would say, I get it. There's some people that have hurt you pretty badly and... And I'm not excusing that or belittling that. I'm just saying don't make things worse on yourself by separating from the very church from which Christ says this is where you're going to learn love. This is where you're going to be completed. This is where the Spirit works through you for the greater body. Uh, so, Yeah, that's yeah. good. Yeah, and I've seen it. I mean, I think one of the things that we've experienced in We Are Church is um, it's very common that if we're going to really be doing life together, mm -hmm. we're really going to be connected, that people are going to fail us, people mm -hmm. are going to hurt us. And, of course, there are extreme examples, like we were kind of getting at with, like, maybe big moral failure from mm -hmm. somebody that's a major leader. But then there's even the nitty-gritty of in life together, naturally you're going to offend me, I'm going to offend mm -hmm. you. Um, there's going to become conflict. And I've seen Jesus, the, all, the, all the commands in the New Testament around our one, love for one another, if we can persevere in those, there's great mm. blessing, like you're saying. Mm. But it's so common to just go, you know, I'm out. You know, you yeah. hurt my feelings or, you know, I don't like this person. Mm. And community is tough in that respect. Um, and it's even can be very hard as a leader when you're trying to... Mm in the flesh maybe trying to please everybody and you know and, and things can get messy yeah. yeah yeah i mean there's i i would just I, I don't even know how to say it because there have been times in my life where i've just felt like i've just been arrogant like i get it's like this combination part of it is my arrogance and part of it is like this resolve like i am not going to do this in the wrong way so even if if no one follows me i'm going this direction i have to because i see it in the scriptures and that's not a bad thing but there's just this other side that's like arrogant in that or can be arrogant and was arrogant in me of I know I'm right and so I'm going without you and gosh I don't know how, because I I want people to grow up I want my children to grow up and go I don't care if all my friends go this direction I mean right they'll then go with me I, I still will follow and I'm going to do this and yet there's this other humble side that has to say no the scriptures say i am not created to do this by myself i'm a part of the body and so to to find those godly brothers and sisters and say we've got to figure this out together um you know everyone wants to do the isaiah here am i send me um when new testament is supposed to be here we are send us um that we're not supposed to do this by ourselves so we gotta we've got to figure that somehow in humility and in strength um and that's it gets complicated mm, that's good well maybe just maybe last word from you on as you and you can close us with anything else as you think about current church context 
what's going on in the world today, in the church today, as you think about leaders, anything else you'd want to say, um, mm. leaders in the church, what what we're kind of faced yeah. with in the church today? Yeah, it's very easy to panic, very easy to get discouraged, very easy to try to come up with a strategy to fix all of this. Um I guess I just want to share what the Lord's been emphasizing over and over and over with me the last few months. And and that's that I, I need to have times where I just receive His love. Where Someone was sharing the other day, you know, you've got Peter who's always thinking about what he was going to do. And uh, almost, you know, it's before the Spirit indwelt. But uh, he's like, I'll never deny, I, I, I. And then you've got John that's just the beloved. Mm. It was a, I don't know if passive's the right word, but he was the object of Christ's affection rather than the subject. And and my life has been about Peter. And this is what I'm gonna do for the Lord and mm. and I will never do this. And you know, my friend pointed out, you know, Peter wasn't at the cross. He denied Jesus. John was. And he mm. was the beloved. Uh, he's the one who just laid there put his head on the chest of Jesus and and I, I guess I can get caught up and not saying Peter's a mess you know or anything like that I'm just saying there's different people we need to learn from uh, and I think I've 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 pursued a lot of Peter and not enough John um, and looking at his example I mean I I've just I always try to be like the Apostle Paul or Peter. I never, I don't really think about John. Mm -hmm. And John's one that wrote those beautiful things in John 13 to 17 about this intimacy with God and how we can be one with him. And, and it's out of the overflow of all of that. And he says, that, you know, and then Jesus, if you love me, you will obey my commands. And, and it's, it's that love that compels us and and so I guess for those leaders that are listening uh, I think this is something we're going to struggle with is uh, you know you're going to have more of that Peter and that Paul mindset uh, and, and some of you may have like an Elijah complex like I'm the only one that's got it right you know and it's like slow down Enjoy the love of Christ. Make sure you're a recipient of that. And you're so filled up by that. And you really believe that you can get so much pleasure. Like he says in Psalm 16, how at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. He leads us down these paths of, of life. Um, enjoy that because... If not, you'll start doing things out of insecurity, out of selfish ambition, out of, I don't know, whatever reason. And then your sheep will start doing that. Mm -hmm. And and then, you know, you, you get equally selfish, you know, ambitious toward, and it causes all these conflicts. Um, but for all, not chasing the love of, Christ, but really just receiving and believing, like uh, 1 Corinthians 5.5 5 says, uh, how the Holy Spirit can actually pour the love of Christ into our hearts, just to crave that and come before God and say, just love me right now. Let me know your love, like Paul talks about in Ephesians 3. Note in a way that surpasses comprehension. 
let me receive it from the Holy Spirit directly to my heart. Because I know it in my head and I haven't been able to make that transition. You know, everyone says from my brain to my heart. Well, you might not need to because it seems like Romans 5.5 5 says the Spirit can actually just pour His love into your heart directly. And to crave that, desire that, seek that out with the church because there's a million things you can talk about and we can fight about and disagree about. We need time to just sit together and receive his love, be blown away by him and boast in him. And as a result of that, then we start working together and I think the sky's the limit of what we can do.